Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Okay, so we'll just give it a few minutes. Uh, I'll wait for everybody to join in, whoever is joining in. And then, um, so first, I would like to just understand all of your background, where you're from, what's your interest in the course, those type of things. Um, and then I will take down your questions. I'll see if, like, you know, you guys have some questions based on the week one content. Then I will go to some sample practice questions which I have prepared, which might be helpful for you to further understand the fundamentals and concepts which are discussed. And then if uh, you know that merits more discussion or more explanation, then I will do that. So I will share all the handouts, all everything that I, you know, whatever I use in the presentation or in the discussion today. So don't worry about that. Uh, but yes, I do look forward to an active participation from everybody. So I'll give it a few more minutes for everybody to join. Until then, uh, why don't each one of you like go turn by turn and just introduce yourselves, like your name, uh, what's your background, and what's like the like you know what's the most best outcome you can you want from say this course like. What is the purpose or what are you looking for getting out of this course? Anybody wants to start? I don't really like calling people out. Just a short introduction about yourselves. Just for me to understand your backgrounds and what you want to get out of the course. Should I start? Yeah, sure, please. Go Hi, uh, I'm Hi. Siddhi. And Hi, uh, I graduated last year. I've done applied arts. Okay. And... Uh, the screen has frozen. In, in the recent... Like, I also wall paint and video, so I need to do that. Hello? Uh, yes, I think you broke off in between. Achha. But is my voice clear now? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I graduated last year uh, and I've done applied arts. I also do... So why this course? Because uh, I do wall painting and wall murals. And during that time, uh, I was, my perspective was turning towards sustainability. And then I realized that why are in the art materials and the way that we dispose these materials, like what is the most best way to not harm the environment and also not harm the creativity. So for that balance, I was looking for uh, articles and research possibilities. And then I tumbled upon this course and I thought that why not join this course? And then later I can, it'll, it'll help me to take that first step towards this idea. So. Great, welcome to the course. So uh, who wants to go next? Uh, I'm seeing Asavari and Prima. There were a few other people, but I think some people have dropped off. Let's hope they'll join back. Would any of you like to go ahead and introduce yourselves? Uh, hi, can I? Yes, please. Uh, hi, so uh, my name is Asavari Deshpande. Um, I've done my graduation in design, Bachelor of Design, just this year. Okay. And um, I, so once I was like uh, participating in competition and uh, with one of the products I had designed during my course and I couldn't win. So I looked at different products which uh, bagged uh, great ranks in the competition. So they were all, they had this aspect of sustainability. So that's when I got curious and that's when I, I uh, realize the importance of sustainability and um, as a designer that is a very very important constraint to consider in the entire product life cycle so that's why i am in this course and i'm wanting to study this great wonderful <laughs> welcome to the course um, so who else is there uh yeah my name is tanya yes hello Danya. hi ma'am uh, i'm doing phd in nit calicut and for my course, 
uh, for my title, I'm trying to incorporate sustainability. So that's why uh, we took up this course. Nice. Nice Thank to you. know. Welcome to the course. Yes, uh, and who else is there? I think uh, Pratik Bashpay, are you there? Am I audible? I am not able to hear him. I think his audio is not connected. I'll just give a few minutes um, in case somebody is joining. I'll just mute myself for a few minutes. Like I think two, three other people are trying to join. Let, let's just wait for others to join. Okay, so I think uh, others have introduced themselves, only I remain. So my name is Aarti Agarwal. I will be one of the TAs for this course. I'll be the one who will be taking the live sessions in this course. And uh, I am a PhD scholar from IIT Kanpur. My main area of research itself is designed for sustainability. And uh, um, I am also a PMRF scholar. It PMRF is a fellowship scheme by the Prime Minister's Office, which supports researchers whose research they consider to be useful or promising, whatever the criteria is. And um, as a part of that fellowship, we also teach students in some area, some field of our choosing. So this is my area of interest and I hope expertise. So that is why I'm taking this course for all of you. Let's hope. We have a very productive uh, session. So, like as I said in the beginning, the way I envision it, I will first ask you guys what are your questions, and I will take down your questions. And if I feel like it's a good idea to clarify your questions right away, I will do that. Otherwise, I will take them down, and then I will go, uh, you know, over it topic by topic in the sequence in which more or less in the sequence in which it was there in the instruction material in the course. So for that, I will also share some practice questions with you just to for you to check your own understanding. It's not an assignment. You don't have to worry about doing the questions or something. We will discuss everything in the class itself. So uh, it's just a good practice for you. And then, um, you know, I will just go over e the explanation for each question uh, you know, in that same sequence. So is that okay? Can we start? Um, or does anybody else have anything else to ask? Okay, so if you guys have any questions, let's just first go with that. Um, I would I'd like to take them down if you have any questions. You can raise your hand if you have any questions. Otherwise, I will start my questions then. <laughs> um, hello? Yes. Hi, uh, I... Like while doing the course in lecture three, I had one question. Uh, okay. There was an example of the Levi's jeans where they took plastic and recycled it to make the jeans in a part of the jeans. Okay. Uh, but doesn't that, it does not end anything, right? The plastic still remains and when it, we when it like the jeans is not in use or whatever later, it becomes microplastic if it's crashed out. Uh, so how, like this is not an absolute cycle. It's just one solution. So I just wanted to ask that, how does it like end discardation? Like what is it? Okay, so that's a good question actually. What you asked is very pertinent and I think uh, Professor Banerjee discusses some part of that in the next week. 
So okay. uh, some part of it, I think she will be covering. But I will still answer your question because you actually talked about a very fundamental, uh, you know, aspect of evolution of design for, for sustainability, which is where she mm-hmm. starts the next week instruction actually. Okay. But I'll 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 cover it in today's session also. No problem. Okay. Any other question? Uh, there's a sample question paper. Sure. So um, I will take a note of this. I'm not sure if there is already an existing sample for uh, you know the final exam question paper. But uh, we will most likely we will be having a review live session in which we will just be discussing the uh, you know sample questions for the final exam, like a review for the exam or something like that. So, um, you know, I can try to put together something myself or, uh, you know, I can ask the other course team to put together or if they have something previously. So, uh, Sudhanya so saying she wants last year's papers or something. So, I, um, I don't have access to last year's exam papers and I'm not sure if they are available. But like I said, I will be sharing practice questions with all of you in every class. So I think that serves the same kind of purpose, right? You want to understand what kind of questions and um, like have some more practice with the questions. So we will we will be covering that. And if possible, I will try. I will request the course team and I will ask them. This is actually not my area, but if they have it, I will definitely ask them to share it with you if, if it's possible. So any other? This is more of an administrative question. Any other question on the coursework itself? The last one week's content. There are four lectures actually in week one. So anybody wants to go for it? Any other question? It's her just joining. So I think a few people are joining a little bit late. I'll, I'll just let them join. Okay. So the people who have only just joined, uh, would you like to please introduce yourself and tell me what you would like to get out of your course or out of this course? Like in terms of what's your background, what's your motivation for taking this course? Just for my own understanding, there are no marks attached to this. Anybody? Am I audible? Hello, madam. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, madam, I am Lakshman Audhani from Pune. Okay. And I have joined this course to... Uh, include this aspect in the uh, i'm uh, actually teaching design subject machine design subject mm-hmm. in to include this uh, aspect in the uh, teaching learning i will join this course to update myself thank you Great. wonderful welcome to the course i hope it's useful for you uh, i think there was one more person is she there is she dropped off all right. Like, uh, just give me a minute or so. I'm just pulling up the practice questions which I have uh, prepared. Until then, if any of you guys have any questions, please use this time to ask me that. So, you know, we can take an account of what your questions are first. Uh, you know, wherever you have any doubts or even if you feel like you're not completely agreeing with something. Uh, you know, you have concerns, something, uh, then we can first discuss that and then we can go to my questions. All right, so I think one more person is joining in. I'll just give it a few minutes for people to join in.
So, uh, am I audible? For the person who's just joined in. Neeraj Barde. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, welcome to the course. I just wanted everyone to first introduce themselves. If you can just tell me, uh, you know, a little bit about yourself, like your background, what you are looking for from this course, just for my own understanding, so I can, you know, understand the context for your being in the course. Yes, ma'am. Myself, uh, Neeraj Bhadde, from Double Tourism College, Double Food. And my motive for this course for gaining knowledge is accessibility course. And from uh, this course, I gain credit for my college. Uh, sorry, what is your field? Which field you're from? Mechanical. 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 Okay. Mechanical. Okay, great. So, welcome to the course. So, what I'll do now is, um, you know, I'll try to give you guys... And uh, so, yeah, first, since a few people joined in, like, do any of you have any questions for me? If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me right now. Because if you don't have questions, then we'll go to my questions and I will take up some questions. And we will go over that. And it's nothing like it's not an exam or anything. It's just some practice questions for all of us to test our understanding of design for sustainability what we can do better, what we think needs to be done, you know, things like that. So I'll just mute myself for two minutes, just think, go over the course content if you need to, just for two minutes. And I mean, let's see if anybody joins in also in those two minutes, and then I will actually start with the, uh, you know, the proper questions. You can also type in the chat box here. If you feel uncomfortable speaking up, you can try type in the chat box as well. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK. Um, so let's first go over some basic fundamentals, and then I will start sharing my questions. And, uh, maybe I can also explain it better with some questions. So let's first start with you know basics. So what is sustainability? So what do you guys think? So this, I mean, this session, this live session is meant to be very, very interactive, at least that's, I, I think, is the best way for learning this particular subject. So since we've already covered week one course, and I think most people understand most of what is there in a week one lecture, so let's just bring a few ideas forward. What, what do you think is sustainability to begin with? 
anybody wants to start one there's no right or wrong answers here just share your ideas i just want to understand like you know what is your understanding what you, you don't have to give me some you know textbook definition or something you can just as easily just tell me in your own words hello yes um it could be understanding what your needs are and not the wants like sustaining what you already have mm -hmm. okay all right anybody else wants to try uh so dhanya is saying something future generation needs access to things we have uh, pratik is saying ability to maintain or support a process over time uh and dhanya is saying it shouldn't get exhausted okay any other ideas anyone else hmm no nobody wants to sorry my handwriting is not very great but hopefully i'm capturing what you guys just said um what else am i to say should not get exhausted so just pick some of the keywords from what you guys said in the class let me see there's something else um able to maintain at a certain level a hold or endure okay um green infrastructure okay i don't know what's green infrastructure but all right solution that will last more time without harming the environment so harming environment okay last more time okay anything else uh, fulfilling the needs of current generations without compromising the needs of future generations that's right you gave me the definition from the brandlin commission report so that is the textbook definition but i'm not asking about the textbook definition it's good that you know the textbook definition but i just want to hear from your you know in your words you're saying led approve okay any other ideas is that it have i got everything on the screen or am i missing something you can unmute yourselves and speak also if you think there's something you want to discuss or mention anything else so what are we trying to sustain that's my first question okay we talk about sustaining but what are we sustaining so anybody wants to speak up hello yes um resources natural resources natural resources okay that's a good start um then what are the natural resources we want to sustain all natural resources or only some of them and why some of them so i think it's this is a good time when people speak up i can read your messages but it's i think 
a lot more meaningful if you speak up. Anybody wants to go for it? I see some people typing things. But it might be nicer if you speak up. Fuel and resources. Sorry? Fuels. Uh, for, what, what's that? Sorry, say again. Fuel, fuel. Fuel. You're saying fuels. Yeah. Okay. But is it only fuels? No, but making sure it doesn't get exhausted. Yes. So uh, fuels is one of the answers. So you're saying fuels is one of the things we're trying to sustain, that they don't get exhausted. Yes. Right? Okay. Then Pratik Bashpe is saying resources which are getting exhausted. Okay. But are all resources which are getting exhausted a concern or is it only some of them? And what is the criteria for that? Of being more concerned, say, about some resources and less concerned about other resources. What's the criteria for that? Uh, limited resources like the fossil fuels or petrol, diesel. Limited. So one criteria is they are limited. Limited. Okay. That's very good point. Any other criteria for which resources we are trying to preserve? Or are we trying to preserve all? Anything else? Um, no. We should be trying to preserve all. Because we should be is, trying to preserve all. Yeah, okay. Because if it's in the if it's in nature, it mm -hmm. it's not something that uh, it has no use. If it's there, there has to be some use. Okay, that's a very good point. Please excuse my handwriting, and I know it's not very good, but. Um, we have to work with what we've got. So, okay. Now, I, I won't take up more time, but I'll come to the, the, somebody else is joining. So, uh, these are some really good ideas and I think everyone has almost got it, but we missed one key word here, which I think is very, very fundamental to uh, this whole discussion. Does this ring a bell? Yes. So, uh, this is where I, you know, uh, I generally draw a diagram. It's just my screen is looking a bit, a bit stuck. Okay, one second. Okay, let's try a new whiteboard. Right, so when we talk about resources, there are two types of resources. One is natural, one is man-made. Based on, you can say, origins of resources. When it comes to natural, there are renewable and there are non-renewable. Right? And, um, you know, amongst the non-renewable, non-renewable can actually also be called, you, they're almost used interchangeably, exhaustible resources. But the philosophy behind non-renewable and exhaustible is slightly different. When we say exhaustible, we mean that resources which can be exhausted. Non-renewable, we mean we have not found any method to renew it yet. And what we mean by renewable is not that it cannot be renewed. So, you know, whether it is, uh, whether it is uh, coal, whether it is petrol, whether it is diesel, all of these can be renewed, whether it is forest. The problem is not that it cannot be renewed at all. The problem is that they cannot be renewed in uh, any significant amount of time. It takes decades to grow a forest and it takes maybe a few hundred years to, you know, replenish the resource of petrol, diesel, I mean, oils, natural, uh, you know, resources like mining, uh, coals and other elements. So all these elements 
Uh, so somebody is asking how to renew petrol. So you won't, we don't get petrol when you, you know, drill oil out of the earth. What you get is just oil. That is further refined into different types of oils and different chemical processes that are, uh, you know, carried out. So you, what you get eventually are other different types of oils. What you get is just um, unrefined oil from when you drill the earth, the ocean, whatever. And that process of renewal is nature's way of recreating itself. So nature is already renewing all these resources. But the timeline is what is the biggest problem for us. It's not the fact that these non-renewable resources are completely non-renewable. They are renewable, but on a very almost infinite timeline. So if we are able to recover the same level of, say, uh, fossil fuels in maybe 200 years or 150 years, that is not really a, of any use to us within the next few years. It, we will still run out of oil in the next 20, 30 years or whatever is the timeline set for that because the process of renewing is very, very, very slow. Similarly, uh, you know, we talk about some of the other things like forests. Some forests can be grown. They can be regrown. And we have so many great examples of people who took, uh, you know, like a, a desert kind of a patch of land and they regrew the entire forest in a few decades. But it takes a few decades. That is one problem. And the second is some forests, like rainforests, like the Amazon rainforests, they cannot be regrown to that same kind of uh, ecosystem or that same kind of, you know, a biome which exists now. There's a loss of biodiversity associated with that loss of natural resource. So in this sense, um, you know, when we talk about renewable and non-renewable, we when we talk about non-renewable resources, we often only think in terms of matter, you know, like forests or mines or coal or oils. But biodiversity, life, all types of life forms are also a resource. And they can also be lost. And we would like broadly put them in this category of non-renewable because some life forms, once they go extinct or once they reach that critical stage, it's very difficult to revive them. And it's not just loss of those life forms alone, but their presence is uh, important for so many other human and man-made processes, right? If, if butterflies were to go extinct, a lot of other plant life would stop, you know, uh, reproducing itself. So I could go on and on, but I think you understood what I'm trying to say here, that uh, the main concern with these non-renewable is this sorry something funny yeah it's this non-renewable resources which are the major concern but like somebody pointed out that you know we should be preserving all resources and I agree with that because there are two criteria for resource um, conservation or preservation one is the utility point of view which is, you know, the more economic kind of view that, you know, you need to preserve it, really. you need to derive anything carries value only based on the utility we can get out of it. That is more of an economist kind of perspective, but even economists like usually acknowledge that many things are worth preserving just for their own intrinsic value, not the utility value of it. So, you know, a, a, a planter with flowers, it may not be serving any utility, but it, it serves... It has its own intrinsic value. So similarly, so many things around us have their own intrinsic value. And we don't need to always see in terms of utility. So when we come back to the whole question of sustainability now, what we are trying to do is we are trying to sustain all of these resources in a way that we don't use, up, use them up so much that there is nothing left for future generations which is where the Brundtland report, uh, you know, definition comes in, that with, you serve the needs of the present without compromising the needs of the future generations. And uh, we should not consume this. It's a, of course, it's, an, uh, it's pretty much like, not like a closed, you know, discussion. It's a still very much in discussion how you can maximize our, like how we can maximize our own profits or our own utility uh, without you know compromising on what we leave to future generations that is where all of this comes in so now if i go back to uh, 
right so let's go back to where we were what is sustainability now in this we have this is the you know the brunson report definition which somebody already gave us now what is unsustainable i think from here unsustainable is not that difficult to understand right anybody wants to take a shot at giving a, like a one line definition of what is unsustainable seems not that difficult from here at least but it doesn't necessarily have to be anybody so let's just say products processes uh, behaviors patterns um consumption anything which is kind of you know compromising on um like which is kind of compromising on our ability to sustain to maintain our natural resources uh without you know uh sort of which is compromising our ability to sustain natural resources or is kind of reducing their quality over a period of time for the next generation so that's a very broad way of you can say putting it and now since we are studying this design course this is a very important question which i wanted to take up in the class so why do you think that we as designers especially need to care about sustainability why is that is it like just that because everybody studying it so um you know so we should also study it or do you think there is a very specific reason why designers should be worried and should be concerned and should take the question of sustainability very seriously so this is where you guys speak <laughs> and now i take a sip of water anybody wants to go for it this is a very important question actually hello um ideally everyone should care about sustainability but as designers why because we have the power to give solutions uh to any kind of market because designers are present everywhere and uh they can they have the power to advise and give solutions to the marketers or business people or any one for that matter and if designers know that these are some of the methods of sustainability we'll be able to penetrate it into the market uh in on a large scale maybe okay great that's a good answer anybody else you want to expand on it or compress what she just said so i think you will get a lot more out of this class if you guys uh, you know share your thoughts your ideas like in this class at least when i am uh, teaching there are no wrong answers or wrong questions it's all a learning process so i welcome all of you to share your thoughts and your ideas and we are all learning here so it's not about you know check walks in something um so i think as designers we impact uh, we create a impact to okay so we don't even mm -hmm. just design for the consumers so obviously our designs have a great impact of consumers but also the entire world the entire system so mm -hmm. if 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 we should look at how our product fits in the entire system how it gels with the system how it sustains the way systems work i mean those systems can be environment social cultural the different dimensions of sustainability so yeah because of because of this huge impact we need to look and care about sustainability right exactly that's a good answer so uh thank you uh, am i pronouncing your name correctly how is your name pronounced is asavari uh, yeah right perfect asavari okay yeah 
so that's the uh, like i think both siddhi and asavari captured the you know, the main point which i wanted to convey which is that you know as designers like you know if you look around you just wherever you're sitting just look around you you're surrounded by products right whether it's the table it's the chair it's the computer you're using it is the phone you're using is the water bottle you're drinking water from or you know whatever it is that is around i don't know what else is around you guys but whatever objects you see around you all the time except for maybe plants and trees leave those aside but everything else has been designed by somebody right isn't that so we are surrounded by products designed by someone now whether it was a conscious design or not whether they put a whole lot of thought into that design or not whether they try to make the design sustainable or not is a different question but we are all the time all of us we are surrounded by a lot of products and all of those products have been designed by somebody or the other at some point of time some products may be very you know copying a very old design or something like that or you know it's an age old thing which has just been you know put in different colors and materials over a period of time whatever it is at the end of the day we are surrounded by products and it's not just you and me every one of us in every part of the world we are surrounded by products designed by somebody who was a designer or is a designer with they may not even think of themselves as designers but one way or another by creating a product which is there for people to use you are doing something that call that merits to be called as design right am i right there or does anybody contest this point right that is what design essentially is creating products creating services creating spaces uh which people use or interact with and what is the biggest cause of unsustainability in our world today it is these things products spaces materials right these are the reasons for unsustainability either through the manufacturing process or through the materials used in it or through the effect they have on people uh, or through you know what you do with it after you're done with that product the fact remains that it is all these products these services these spaces we live and work in they are all they are only contributing to uh, you know say you can call it as human beings footprint on the planet right that is what is the the main cause of unsustainability there are very few nature's processes which are unsustainable right there are some processes of course that's how extinction happens but major cause of unsustainability is all of these products these spaces these materials all of that which is why designers are the people who need to study about sustainability the most because we have already made it's not just that we are going to make impact in the future we have already made so much impact in all of these decades more than centuries almost one and a half century at least of innovation of creating products and spaces what not and even before one and a half centuries i mean we were still building houses right it's not like we were living on uh, on the streets so ever since human beings have actually started to build or create things for their own use for others use the question of sustainability has always been relevant and it's always the designers i'm not saying the designers are bad people or they are to blame or something like that i'm just saying that designers hold a lot of power so what you make matters how you approach it matters how people use it matters and all of this is decided by all of us designers how we create products makes a huge difference much more than we realize because when you think about it it's even if like you know we think okay only if my product is not successful only 50 people are buying it but you have made a difference in those 50 places where 50 people are using your product and the products which are very successful millions of people use imagine the kind of impact you are having and we don't realize we have so much power but the fact is we have always had that power which is why if we want to fix the problem of unsustainability in our world it is the designers who need to learn about sustainability urgently at least that's what i think 
we need to learn about it urgently because it is we who are continuously designing more products, who are continuously coming up with more, uh, you know, services, items, spaces, uh, what not, right? And that is continuing to impact the world. So we, I think, by now, hopefully, have convinced and hopefully, you all agree that designers do need to care about sustainability, and that is because we hold a lot of power to change this equation, to flip this equation from being unsustainable to a sustainable way of living. Now, but when it comes to the, like, you know, the process of design, what is design for sustainability? There are like so many aspects to consider, like somebody is asking about those denims that, okay, we recycle plastic and we've got denims, but what then? Isn't that unsustainable? It's a very good question, which is why design for sustainability is a very complex matter. It's not as simple as A plus B equals C, right? It's not, it's not a linear logic. Uh, it's not even a quadratic logic. It's very, uh, you know, intertwining kind of reasoning here. But in this course, what we will attempt to do and what I think um, is a very good approach for design is unscrambling that very complex process. So uh, I think the main focus of the course is system design and product system design and some related methods. But we will discuss other methods also. I think it's there in the next week. Other approaches to design for sustainability, which have been used. And we will, I think we study in more detail, we'll be studying product system design and life cycle design. I think that is the focus. But whatever it be all said and done, what you will be learning are actual tools and methods which you can use in a, a very structured way to go about design for sustainability. Because there are so many aspects to consider. And to make this complex process more accessible, more understandable, more, uh, you know, um, more, uh, what do you call it? discrete, uh, sorry, not discrete, more tangible, you can say. We have all these design tools. So now the other question, this is actually the answer in a way to what she was asking, um, that you know, sustainability can only be assessed on a scale as of now. Like you can put up some metrics and you can um, you know, look at say the water footprint or the carbon footprint or some other footprint, or you can define your own indicator you can make it concrete to some extent. But even then, when you're talking about two products, we don't have a foolproof method of giving a rating, for example, to a product for how sustainable it is. We can only say relatively speaking. That, you know, for example, like I have a, a bag here, you know, which is made of recycled plastic. And they can only say 50% of this material is forced from recycled waste, from recycled plastic waste. They cannot say it is 50% sustainable. It's not. There's no way to say it. it. doesn't make any sense, right? Similarly, you see a lot of products these days. They will say this is a net zero product. What is a net zero product? Does anyone know? It's a very commonly used language. Uh, um, that means zero waste has been generated or? No, no. That's a broad. That's you're saying it's a broader. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, that's a broader interpretation. But what people mean when they write net zero is there are net zero emissions. So they're talking about emissions in that. Um, in that, But that phrase, it could be interpreted to mean anything. But the language usually means when they say net zero is net zero emissions, uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. So when they say that there are, this is a net zero product, it's not that they're not sending out any emissions. They're also sequestering a similar proportion of the carbon dioxide or something from the atmosphere. So on net net, it's zero. So they may be emitting certain, like, you know, certain maybe kg or whatever unit you want to use to measure it, um, GHG emissions. But at the same time, they're also sequestering it. So net is zero. That's what they need to say. So again, you will see that some products carry this kind of a labeling out in the marketing. You will see this language, net zero emissions, things like that. This much is like the Parley Ocean shoes, Adidas Parley shoes. They will tell you 80% of this is from recycled ocean plastic. 
things like that. But you see, they can make it concrete only up to a certain level. Nobody can say this is 80% sustainable. This is Nobody can actually claim that it's 100% sustainable. They can say that it is um, used 100% organic materials or organic 100% natural materials. They can say that. But there is no scale, there is no metric to say this is this much sustainable. That we still don't have. So we can assess sustainability only on a scale as of now and in a context. What is the purpose you want to fulfill? What is the use? What is the design brief, so to say? That is important when you're talking about sustainability. So now we come to some of the important um, you know, aspects of sustainability. But uh, before that, let me throw a few questions at you. And uh, let's see how you go with that. Okay. So whatever, um, you know, I'm showing you the slides or the questions and all, these will all be shared with you. So don't worry of that. Um, don't worry about that. Okay. So I will share my screen with the questions now. Um, You can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Let's just stick with the first question. So this is just a practice question which um, I put together for all of you. Let's just spend some time thinking about this question. This is, I think, even more complex than the one which Siddhi uh, was talking about. So this is the case for a toothbrush. If we all use toothbrushes, hopefully. <laughs> so there are several types of toothbrushes in the market, right? And they all claim, most of them at least, they all claim that they are very sustainable and they are very eco-friendly and they are very, um, you know, good for the environment, they're very good for your health, that type of a thing, right? So now my question is, out of all these products in the market, which do you think is most sustainable or more sustainable, maybe not most? Bamboo toothbrush. So you have to give reason for what, um, you know, for what, where you think is more sustainable. So let's just go over the options once. once. One is the A is electric toothbrush, which has a plastic body. It has replaceable batteries. And it needs, they say it needs replacement every six months, but I think it's up to your use, how much, how you use it. The, I've also mentioned the price. You have to make a note of that. There is a reason why I mentioned the price also. It's priced at $8.99. Then there is a bamboo toothbrush, but it, it's not entirely bamboo. The bristles are still nylon. And it is, say, priced at 125. These are all actual prices. I've not made up the prices or something. I've actually given you the real prices for these items. Then there is a regular toothbrush, you know, which you normally use. And I don't want to slam any brand or anything, but the type of toothbrushes which we have been using for decades, this is that type of a toothbrush. Uh, and the price is 110 rupees. And the last option is a neem stick or what we traditionally call as a dantoon or something. And it is priced between two to four rupees per stick, but you can't buy just one stick. You have to buy an entire pack of at least 20 sticks or something. And if you are lucky, you may have a neem tree around your corner. And if you are very, very, very hands-on person, you can also, you know, get a neem stick from the neem tree and take the risk of using that because it can have insects also in case you have actually tried that. So now what are the criteria we are going to use for deciding this? That's my first question. How do we decide which is more sustainable? Anybody? In the given context, one could be sustainable uh, like to the other. 
we cannot decide completely like if uh, i were to answer the first one is not sustainable because it has a plastic body it also uses energy like batteries like that is energy it's high priced so economically uh, environmentally and uh, socially uh, i'm not sure about the socially one but yeah both like in these two contexts this is not as sustainable as other three the second one yes as asabri said that out of the four if we had to choose uh the bamboo one because everyone more or less everyone can buy it uh and it it does not use plastic um a regular toothbrush is economically good but not uh environmentally because everything is plastic and unless it is recycled it is just going to go in the dump yard and the neem stick i'm not sure about socially being acceptable the neem stick and economically is it is good environmentally or also it is good but how like is it very easily available we are not sure of that yeah okay so you said several things in the electric toothbrush you said that firstly it has plastic secondly it has batteries thirdly it's expensive so you know it's not sustainable now how frequently do you replace a normal toothbrush two three months two three yeah. months right so if you buy say three months so you will maybe use four normal toothbrushes toothbrushes you know in year so that comes to how much comes to how much expenditure i want to please yeah right so in two years you will use spend 1000 rupees on it correct right now yeah. an electric toothbrush can last for up till 5 10 years you just have to replace the head that to it say 6 months but actually last more than 6 months 8 months so at a certain so the thing is what you uh, what you said was not wrong it was just that we were looking in a limited timeline which is what Correct. i wanted to highlight Correct. when we talking about sustainability we need to think in a longer timeline there's no i mean we can't look at an infinite timeline because that's not possible for us uh, it's technically not possible it's mathematically difficult but at least 5 years 10 years is reasonably you know doable so if we talk about just electric toothbrush maybe in 2 years 3 years you will already have you know broken even or recovered or you know become more economically viable so the the electric toothbrush may not be very economically viable right now but after 2 years it would be because in 2 years you would have spent around 1000 bucks on a bamboo toothbrush and uh, the electric toothbrush you would have spent only 899 in the original thing and you may have changed the head maybe once or twice and the head is not that expensive so you may have actually you know, almost recovered the costs maybe not two years three years two and a half years something like that depending on how much you spend and all that kind of thing right so plus also see there's a other cost to it so when we are talking about something like a dental process electric toothbrush is actually the one of the reasons why people prefer it is because it cleans your teeth better so you know with the same or lesser effort which you put in with a regular toothbrush say from user you know user usability perspective the electric toothbrush is far more effective in cleaning your teeth and removing plaque and all those kind of things i won't go into details but that is a very like you know, that is a main feature of an electric toothbrush because you have those bristles which are vibrating at very high frequency so it reduces your dental costs over a period of time that is the reason why it's more highly priced and in dental costs you could be spending anything from 1000 2000 bucks to 10000 bucks if you are not if your teeth are not in great health 
So there are other costs to consider, which is why I think now you see that this is not that simple or straightforward question, because we do need to consider human health also in we talk about sustainability. But even if you don't consider that, if you just look at the other items, um, so plastic is one of the uh, the problems with sustainability, and we know that plastic you know, it ends up in a plastic, um, you know, dump or um, in the ocean, things like that. But what if the plastic can be reused, if it can, if it can be upcycled? That was the second thing. Third thing, there are other materials like nylon. So nylon is also, take, it also takes a very long time to actually disintegrate. So what about that? Like bamboo, okay, you can remove the bamboo and you can reuse it or you can just you know, there are many ways of disposing it or using it. But what about the nylons? Nylon bristles are still nylon, right? So my coming back to the main question, which is what I was asking, was that what is the criteria we are going to even use to understand whether something is sustainable or not? So for that, we'll come back to the question which I was going to originally. Right, so we will look at this now. This is the reason why I was asking. So what we understand as sustainable, it's very difficult to characterize, it, right? How do we go about characterizing something? How do we say that it is sustainable, it is not sustainable? What is the yardstick? So for simplifying that aspect of sustainability, we have these three you know, pillars of sustainability, that's what they're called, which is economic, environmental, and social sustainability, right? Now, we could have thought that you know, only environmental may have been enough. Why do we need to hook? talk about economic and social sustainability. So what do you think? Do we really need to talk about economic and social sustainability or is it irrelevant? Why do we need to talk about in economic and social? Why aren't we happy with just environmental sustainability? Why are these two other circles also there? Um, because, because as humans, we would like to move from growth to growth, like from one level to another. And for that, social and economic aspects are equally important. Also, uh, uh, hmm? one, I just forgot, sorry. No, no, go ahead. It's okay, you can think, take a moment to think if you need to. Anybody else? Somebody else just joined in. Gopal Krish, uh, I can't read the full name. Gopal Krishna, his iPad. Uh, hello, madam. Uh, I'm sorry, I joined late. Uh, I have no problem. Today. So, so, yeah, yes. Uh, so, this course, I, I, I have just gone through, I think, uh, that uh, first uh, one and a half weeks of videos. Um, so, basically, I, 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 uh, I got yeah. the sense of it. First, I think you're uh, trying to describe what is a system. And then so uh, we'll come uh, wait, 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 wait. We'll come to that later. I just wanted to know what's your background and what you wanted yeah, yeah. to get from the course. So I am a, I am an electrical engineering. I'm a teacher. Okay. And uh, okay. actually I was an I was an IT professional mm -hmm. and uh, now I turned a teacher at uh, Bits Pilani. And okay. uh, so this course I'm using as a part of a domain certification of product design. So I'm okay. uh, I'm a just for my own interest. I'm a, I'm a senior lecturer. Sure. So, so sure. I, uh, because sustainability is the topic of the town now and everything what we do. So mm -hmm. I registered for this course and uh, just going through it. Yeah. Great, wonderful. So uh, we will come to system design in a bit. Systems thinking. I'm just uh, just to give you because you just joined in. Just to give you an idea, we are just trying to understand how can we go around even characterizing sustainability. And if there are certain parts 
we have added to the definition like economic and social why have we added it so i'm just trying to ask uh, you know a pertinent question so we are not mugging up things or we are not like because there are people from all sorts of background there is a certain reasoning behind everything we have you know discussed what what we are going to be doing and it's important to know why those aspects are there yes so yes, welcome sir. welcome to the course what i'm yes. discussing right now is <clears throat> just this just asking this question if anybody wants to take a shot at answering why have we included economic and social sustainability in this uh, whole diagram shall i answer uh, based on my understanding okay sure yeah uh, see um, okay sustainability is all about the environment okay uh, so that uh, see uh it, it 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 is a behavior which we have to inculcate in citizens okay the citizens are driven by economic need and also driven by the social culture and compulsions so that is the reason that uh, you know purely focusing on the environmental looks like a goody goody statement like you know ideal thing but uh, we have to also see that how economical it is for people uh to buy a sustainable products uh, whether uh, the products are uh, may, are pre, are uh, made within the reach so um, whoever taking that uh, this uh, sustainability goals uh, we have to see the affordability of uh, that uh, you know eco friendly products as well as uh, drive uh, that habit among the society by you know uh, because if my neighbor is also you know segregating the waste into reusable recycling and everyone does it you know it is the social change the social awareness and change so that is the reason that these two are uh, included that's what i understand yeah okay cool that's a good answer anybody else i think siddhi was raising her hand you want to try again siddhi yeah i just recalled what i wanted to say uh, sure that uh, as humans the quality of our lifestyle also matters and that is why economical and social aspects come into picture everything that uh, sir said i think that come sums up wonderful okay so what <laughs> happens if we make uh, if we make a very eco friendly product right say suppose uh, there's uh, what's the most what's the most common product which we all hate single use plastics it's like that's a very common evil in the society right now uh, why do you think it's so successful it's like almost everywhere we just can't get rid of it it's everywhere every thing where you find plastic single use plastic bags why why is it everywhere if it's such a big source if it's such a big evil for the environment for the natural environment i mean why is it everywhere anybody wants to give some options here what what do you think one could be durability and versatility right okay that's correct anything else uh madam uh, i feel uh, that it is driven for example see i belong to the old generation in my days uh, whenever we go to market we used to carry a bag okay a cloth bag or uh, something or basket or something we, actually it was being driven by the uh, uh the vendors who provide those bags okay because of that okay i i can just walk in with my bare hands and anyway they'll give me in plastic bag so i think it is a habit in uh, inculcated by the uh, by the manufacturers or the vendors or the shopkeepers rather than from the consumers actually consumers uh, it is not a see see when, when you are going for a shopping when you are going anything we Uh, you see for example when i wanted to buy meat or something you know the, I, yes people know that you know that to carry something or vessel or basket or something but that whole culture has been drained out uh, uh, from the other side i think not from us that's what i feel no it's not i'm not asking about one side or the other it's a, just a question about why is it everywhere so yes your answer is uh, like it's like i said there are no wrong answers in this class so um you know there could be many ways of looking at it so again i i'll go back to that why so if that culture of carrying your own handbag disappeared why did it disappear yes somebody is giving you an alternative of taking a plastic bag but why would you take that alternative you can still carry your own bag so you know the the question remains that as product designers 
or you can you need not be only a product designer you could be designing anything else also but we have to always go back to the user because we're designing for users if you're designing at the end of the day we it's not art that's the main difference between art and design art is okay you put it up on a wall somebody likes it somebody doesn't like it it doesn't matter it's your wall you put it up that's it end of story that's art but design is something people use it's a part of their lives it changes their lives it changes their behaviors so if people shifted their behaviors why did they shift their behavior they must have been some aspect of that change which appealed to them and i don't want to you know take up too much time but i wanted to see if anybody else wants to take a shot at answering anybody else wants to attempt to uh, give uh, that one, yeah one reason is uh, that uh, because if it is inexpensive and uh, transparent yes. because earlier days we used to people used to give a paper bags okay and uh, wrap it in uh, newspaper and uh, and pack it and give it to us but uh, these days uh, the that paper has become expensive than the plastic so from yes, the yes exactly so i i'll just stop you right there i because you said a very important point which is what i was waiting for somebody to see it's very cheap compare a plastic I, that's why i picked up this example of a plastic bag because over and over again we whenever we talk about environment that is the first problem we come to and yet we are not able to eliminate it completely until uh, a year ago even all the packaging which you get all from all these amazon flipkart even that was in plastic even now some of it is but after constant you know campaigning and everything they have at least moved to some other type of packaging but still a lot of the packaging is still plastic that's the reason firstly it is because it is waterproof it's very convenient to carry it has a lot of strength tensile strength you see how much you can carry in a plastic bag versus a paper bag you need a very thick paper if you want to get that kind of strength and even in that paper bag once it it's put in water it gets soggy it will tear immediately right that strength thirdly it's very cheap it's very very cheap so you know if uh, like earlier in the at least till a few years ago we were not charged for plastic bags in shops that tariff has been added only to discourage people from taking plastic bags Uh, you know for to encourage them to bring their own bags but in the like you know till 2 3 years ago like we would go to a shop you buy something they will automatically give you a plastic bag they covered it in their own cost they didn't charge us separately for it why because it was so cheap and they didn't mind offering it as an additional add on to the consumer who is buying it because it makes their shopping experience much better it makes the shopping experience much more convenient like you know you didn't have you don't have to bring anything you can buy and you can leave you can go to your workplace or you can go travel whatever right you don't have to worry about taking back with you so it was given as an add on product or service along with whatever you were buying because it was so cheap so this is why i made this diagram and i asked this question that why do we have environmental along with economic and social because i have seen so many recycled uh paper bags so many other bags you know, made of other materials there are many materials available in the market uh but the reason why none of those take off that easily is because they are more expensive almost five times more expensive at least five times more expensive plastic bags are at least i mean if you buy in bulk and i think you can reduce cost even more and depends on what kind of bag also but you know roughly speaking if you want like a proper big shopping size bag it will be at 1 rupee uh, if you buy it as uh, as a shopkeeper as if you buy as a consumer and they may charge you 2 rupees or 3 rupees or whatever but when they buy it they buy it as at that rate whereas you buy a paper bag it will come to at least 4 rupees so it's 4 rupees it may even be 5 rupees depending on what materials you have used and it doesn't give you the same qualities even after being so much more expensive because not all not all kinds of paper bags are water resistant right so this is why it's important now poor person somebody i i don't want to call poor actually let's just say somebody who is not that economically well off they'll be like you know 5 rupees mein main khana kha lunga 10 rupees mein to mera pura lunch ho jayega right why will i spend 10 rupees on a plastic bag or to replace a plastic bag and i mean i'm getting plastic bags for free everywhere they're on the roads people throw out things or they can get it anywhere 
plastic bags are practically free for them right so why will i not use that why will i use a, a very fancy paper bag which costs me 5 rupees per bag why what is the use and what how does it matter to me right if i'm using plastic or paper it's already there right so this is why both the aspects are important also along with environmental you may have a very eco friendly very environmentally conscious solution but if it is not at a competitive price people won't buy it. that's basic economics it's nothing fancy it's just basic common sense what uh, you know whatever i'm talking about here that we can have many very socially uh, sorry very environmentally viable products and there are many environmentally products viable products but people don't buy them because it's not uh, you know it's not in everybody's capacity to buy something much more expensive only because you're and then there's also this thing right we think like oh we are i'm like one tiny person if i use one more coffee cup how does it matter that's also the, that's the kind of psychology people use so when you're not that sort of you know wealthy or you don't have like tons of dollars in your account that is what you think you have it's always a choice it's not that you are you know buying only this you're buying a lot of things in your to keep your lifestyle to keep up your lifestyle the choice is between spending those extra 100 rupees on this or on that and usually it is that you know you will not spend 100 rupees extra just for environmentally conscious type thing right it's just normal psychology consumer psychology i'm not talking about whether it is good or bad or right or wrong i'm not talking about any of morals ethics anything i'm just talking about how people behave that's how people behave everybody looks after their own you have to look at your bank balance at the end of the day right you have to eat at the end of the day and if you're like you know if you're not that economically well off um you will do your priority will be food on the table it will not be you know what kind of planet we live in for the next generations so now in this if we characterize this further so when we are trying to measure the sustainability or assess the sustainability of something uh, on these three axes if something is meeting only economic and social criteria but it's not meeting the environmental criteria we can call it an equitable solution right because it's economically viable and it's socially viable socially accessible to all sections of the society that is equitable now if something is environmental and it is economically also viable uh, also uh, okay then we call it a viable solution because it is at least something you can put in the market right so for example you are using um, different types of items like say suppose this is a water bottle and you are using some other water bottle which was not that the responsibly sourced in terms of materials now you are using this water bottle which is responsibly sourced in terms of material and they have a similar kind of a price so then this is a viable solution it still doesn't mean that it's a solution for which is benefiting all sections of the society it may not be it may be but it may not be so we can't still call it as a sustainable solution it is still only a viable solution if a solution is environmentally okay and socially also acceptable then we call it a bearable solution theek hai matlab kaam chala lenge that sort of thing but it is still not economically viable so you know it's not necessary that it is going to take off that it is going to make a change in the markets it may not change and make any change in the trends in the markets so it is a bearable solution but when you have an intersection of all three that is when you get a sustainable solution and why it is this is what all everything i just explained that you know it needs to be it needs to at least check all these three boxes right so this is one way of looking at it and this is another way of looking at it that environmental is our you know main um, goal or priority that we want to call it so this is i put it as the big circle then there is a socially uh, you know social component that needs to be socially accessible and socially beneficial to all sections of society 
and then it also needs to be economically um, accessible because if it is too expensive or if it is um, you know not within everybody's reach then very small section of the society will even buy it and if it, nobody buys it it doesn't matter whether the product is there or not and the product matters only if it is in the market but if nobody buys it the company or the startup or whoever they will not survive they will go out of business the product will also go off the of the uh, you know shopping carts they will all will be off the market so unless a product is economically uh, sustainable it will not even remain in the market it will be wiped out which is why even if you're innovating for environmental sustainability you still need to think about economically also right now there's another aspect to it which i will cover um the next few minutes so this is i don't think this requires a whole lot of discussion because i think professor banerjee has already explained this in great detail in the lecture i don't want to repeat it but the only thing i wanted to explain here is that we were talking about social till now in the uh, diagram and that social has been sort of split into politics and culture in this other yardstick on this radar diagram so this <clears throat> radar diagram has uh, six i think for most of them it is six or is it some maybe it is seven there yeah, are seven actually not six there are seven sub headings under each of these headings economy ecology culture and politics now each of these seven criteria i have just listed it on the diagram you can you have enough of this in your slides already you can also check the website um the website is i already there so you can go over this main idea is that we are assessing the sustainability of a product on each of these so there are 28 you know metrics you can say 28 criteria on which we are trying to assess it and the more green it is the better it is the more red it is the worse it is on that particular criteria and this radar diagram basically gives you a very clear holistic view there's if there's a lot of green in the diagram it means it's scoring well on all all sort of metrics if it's very yellow and very red it means it's not a very sustainable product so just by looking at it uh, they have done this more in the context of cities they've done it for johannesburg and new delhi and something else uh, so they have used this broad framework for that but you can use a similar framework and i think she will discuss this in some of the other lectures it's there in the course for a similar such diagram can be used for product design product service design also where we just define these metrics and then we decide you know how we want to measure the sustainability of the product so any questions so far because i covered fair bit of ground in in this few slides okay we'll move forward so in this um we talk about why do we need to care about sustainability now i've covered most of this but this is one chart i wanted to show actually it's a very interesting chart it basically just shows how much our uh, fossil fuel consumption has increased dramatically since the 1960s just look at the growth from 1850 to 1960 that's more than 100 years and from 1960s how much it has suddenly gone off completely vertically till 2021 land use change is also increased but at a slower pace so if you want to know whether the question of sustainability is very urgent or not this chart kind of tells us that it is um this is like just for understanding like greenhouse gas emissions from from where for india and this is different scenarios you know in which uh, we will end up depending on how we perform on the on the goals which are the countries have declared in the paris climate agreement so if we don't have any climate policies then this is where we will end up the top red part this this part this is where we will end up if there are no policies with the current policies this is where we will end up and if um, 
if we actually improve upon our pledges and targets and we meet them, this is where we will end up. And if we actually, there are no clear policies or commitments on these, but these two are the pathways in which we can possibly achieve only 1.5 to 2 degree change in the temperature, right? Okay. This is the loss of biodiversity, like I was talking about earlier. It's just a summary. Um, Right. So this is, yeah, the loss of biodiversity. You can see how much more extinctions have been happening in, you know, in the last few decades. You can study it in more detail with the slides when I share it with you. Uh, and this is just a comparative analysis of the share of population which is undernourished. So you're talking about social, socially sustainable, right? So. You can see that certain parts of the world, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, they still have a very decent sized population, which is still undernourished, not even malnourished, undernourished. I mean, they're not meeting the basic calorie requirement, which they should be meeting. And uh, like these are all just for just interesting things for your context. So the number of deaths by this factor, and you can see that high blood pressure and smoking are the top two, and the third is air pollution. But nobody talks about it. There is so much of hue and cry about so many things, health emergency, and, you know, improving health and this and that, but nobody talks about this third criteria, which is air pollution. And if you look at the most polluted cities in the world, most of them are in developing countries, which is why the question of, again, the socially sustainable practices or products or designs matter because it is in the developing countries where we manufacture a lot of the products which give out these emissions, which make our air toxic. And these products may be sold in other countries. So you see, in developing countries, we are very good at manufacturing. But the problem in the manufacturing sector is that it gives out a lot of emissions. And we export these goods to other countries, developed countries. So they are the consumers. So they don't, you know, these, these kind of cities, this kind of toxic care, they don't get that toxic care. They only get the product. They just pay for the product. But we have to live with, those, with that toxic air, which is the third biggest killer in terms of risk factors, air pollution. So when we talk about the design process, design manufacturing process, we also need to think about, for, a, for, for one, a timeline, which I pointed out earlier, and secondly, geospatially. Like you may be manufacturing products here and polluting the air here, but maybe consume somewhere else. So, you know, for people outside India, many, so many products, are exported from this country, and not just India, even in other South Asian countries. They're exported to, um, you know, European, American, uh, America, and other countries where they love our products, but they don't inherit our environmental problems with the products. They only get the products. We live with the environment. So we are unfairly penalized for our processes, right? So there is a social aspect to it. So this is a similar diagram. This is this visualization of that. So it gives you a context. So if you see this whole a big part of Europe, America, Australia, Canada, they are all very clean. They don't have such a huge problem with air pollution. We look at the South Asia, Africa. Why is it only this part of the world which is suffering with air pollution? It's because we are not, uh, you know, our, our products, our practices are not just not environmentally sustainable, they're also not socially sustainable. There's a, this balanced way in which they affect people. This is a sim similar kind of a diagram. Again, this number of people affected by disasters per 100,000 from 2020. Again, you can see that Asia 
in parts of Africa are much more red than other places in the world. Right? This is the effects of climate change. The effects of climate change, everybody contributes to climate change because you know, all countries give out greenhouse gases. Uh, and in terms of emissions, it's not that America doesn't emit emissions. Many countries give out emissions. But the effects of climate change are felt much more drastically in some parts of the world. And that is because we are not that well equipped to deal with those kind of extreme climatic situations. Um, things like you know floods and landslides and things like that. So we lose human life a whole lot. Oh, there are many examples from the blue economy. So you can, I wanted to share some, but I think it's, um, we have limited time left. So I'll share some of the, I'll go over some of the questions, I think, which was where I was going. Let me just go back to the questions. Then if we have time, we'll take the examples. Okay, so now there's no, there's no like simple straightforward answer for this toothbrush question, but you can take this as an exercise and try to, uh, you know, think about how you want to characterize the sustainability of all these four. For the fourth item, one aspect which I thought people may not consider is, say, suppose we are able to market the name stake and make it as a, you know, a go-to thing for toothbrushes. You know, like you said, it's socially not that acceptable. But I think uh, the main thing is it's bitter and you have to chew it, but it's slightly bitter. But say, suppose we are able to market bitter as bitter as the new sweet or something like that. Say, suppose we can market it, make it, make it economically acceptable. It's already not very expensive. But then what happens? Say, suppose everybody starts using name sticks. And now our population is a whole lot more than what it was 50, 60 years ago, right? Then what happens? There will be a lot of name trees being cut down, and name trees take time to grow. So we may have created a different kind of a problem, right? So, which is why. When we talk about, we'll come to the design processes in the next few weeks. Today, it's only the first week. So when we talk about the design process, we try to think of all aspects of design from beginning to the end to the next beginning, right? Which is where we come to, which is what we have called in one of the design processes as cradle to cradle design, right? So um, did any of you study cradle to cradle design? It is there in the coursework. Can somebody give me a one line summary of cradle to cradle design? Yes, madam. Uh, so I have just gone through what uh, it means to me is uh, if a product uh, is created and uh, at the end of its uh, lifetime, that product uh, takes into another uh, shape. It is reused and uh, gets into new avatar. Okay, again, bond. Okay, that's what I feel. So that means nothing gets thrown as a waste or a recyclable. It, it gets reused. Okay. Exactly. So cradle to cradle design is basically a sustainable design philosophy. It's a system of thinking. It's not just a metric or way of process of designing, but it's a philosophy first. And second, from the philosophy comes the method for designing products. It's a design philosophy first which aims to create products. That's sort of like the vision, what they want to do. The process decides what they actually do, how they achieve it. But at least their vision is to create products that can be continuously reused and recycled without any loss of quality. That is what uh, cradle to cradle design, uh, you know, is aims to do. So now coming to this question, what do you think are the correct answers in this? Question number two. Somebody else wants to try? I think other people, are you all still there? Or is only your, are you only logged in or are you still there? I know it's a slightly longer TA session, but that is just how we have been given the slots. So there's nothing I can do about that. Does anyone want to attempt and tell me which uh, one of these is correct or D, wrong? D means D, minimization of waste generated during production processes. Uh, sorry? Uh, D, D, madam. D. D. Okay. You are saying that that is correct or that is incorrect? Oh, that is correct. Okay. Anybody else? 
Yeah, I think upcycling of materials into other products can be correct. Okay. Uh, are there like multiple? Yes, it says check all answers that are correct. Yeah, it follows a butterfly diagram for inputs and outputs. Okay. Like it's a cycle because of technical and biological. And I am not sure of the B one. Making products that look more like nature. What does that mean, Matlab? So it means making products which look more like nature. Uh, the question is whether it is correct or not. Do you think that applies to cradle cradle design philosophy? Uh, yeah, because it is a biomimetic way. Okay. Like maybe. And a infinite circulation of nutrients. In It's an infinite circulation of products and like products. I don't know about it. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Noted. I think A is not there, but A is not there because we we cannot have that is a that is a ideal. If that is the case, then we don't require agriculture. Okay. All nutrients uh, we can keep on circulating. No. Yeah, it's, okay, uh, that's, yeah, I will come to that. I will come to that. I just want to know if anybody else wants to answer. I don't want to call out people, but I see uh, only two people answering. And there are, I think, four or five other people who may want to answer. Dhanya is saying, C seems not appropriate. Okay. Dhanya, do you want to explain why? You can said, unmute and speak. Yeah, I said it seems most appropriate. Like Oh, okay, okay. All right. Uh, but there are multiple choice answers. So you think only C or something else? Not sure how much. Uh, okay. Am I audible by the way? It's telling me my spelling connection is not stable or something. Can you see and hear me? Am I audible? Hello. Am I audible and visible? Yeah, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize it was not recording. I'll just repeat what I just said. So for the benefit of everybody who wants to see it later. So um, like I was saying that read the question properly. Because in exams, in general, like the question may be very tricky in terms of its wording. So when the question says that in what ways does cradle to cradle design mimic nature's ways, it's not asking whether it is perfect in it, whether it is 100% there or not. But what it is asking is that that is what it's philosophically trying to do. So when you talk about biomimetic, there are three ways of being biomimetic, which is mimicking nature's ways. One is biomorphism, in which you make products which look like nature. Then there is biomimicry which basically tries to create products which understand the way nature functions and then they implement it in the design. That is biomimicry. I think in, there may be something on it in the next week in the different design processes. And the third is cradle to cradle design, um, uh, which is more like it, you know, it kind of tries to follow principles of nature. So this is the third part of uh, biomimetic type of design. Now, in what ways? So, in the first principle itself, a cradle cradle design is that it describes the same and potentially infinite. That is the goal. They may not be infinite, but that's the idea we are trying to work towards. That it is infinite circulation of materials and nutrients also in the cycle. So, I think somebody was not sure how nutrients can be recycled. But in nature, if you see, like, you know, if you don't do anything uh, generally the nutrients are recycled now whether it is recycled in the plant alone or not is not the question in they are being recycled now you eat it and then you pass it on uh, and then it again goes back into the soil or whatever nutrients are always being recycled they may not be recycled in the same place or in the same way it can be used but they are getting recycled so that is what it tries to mimic but in a more you know efficient way then consumables like natural fibers and biodegradable stuff, they all go into a biological cycle where they can be safely reintroduced after use. 
and there are other items which are say non that recyclable like electronic items or materials or say metal and things like that they go into a technical cycle so this is where your butterfly diagram comes in this is the butterfly diagram which shows the entire life cycle in a sense of the product where you know you take a product and then it some parts of it after the end of the product going to the biosphere where you know they again get used in some way and the other parts of it going to the technosphere so for example like in there are a lot of um, electronics companies like mobiles laptops all these companies which usually will take the product from you at the end of its life cycle like and you can give your old tv or your old mobile phone or your old laptop or whatever and they give you some discount and then you buy the next item so what they do is this is sort of what they do they take components parts like you know little little screws a little little items some electronics which then use this to you but they may still be functional they may still be good or they can still be you know um a little with a little tweaking with a little improvement they can still be used almost as good as new so they use reuse those items into the next manufacturing processes maybe for that or some other product because they're very big companies so that is the technosphere as they call it in their philosophy so i would if you're interested i would encourage you to go and look at the cradle to cradle design website it's a very exhaustive website they have explained all this in a whole lot of detail and then this is there are many ways in which they can be used so you know technosphere is mainly that kind of that part of the cycle where you reuse those type of items like metal electronics different materials which are not like not easily biodegradable at least so this is a butterfly diagram and this is a little bit more easy to understand diagram for the same thing biological is for consumption goods like you can see you know the t-shirt becomes something else and it's biodegraded you grow mushrooms something else it becomes nutrients goes into the plant the plant again goes into the production process that's like the biological cycle as they have described it then there is a technical cycle you have a product like i was saying like a tv you use it and then you sell it you sell it back to the to some it may be some other companies so if you bought say a samsung phone you may not return it to samsung you may return it to nokia but they don't care because all these products use some basic integral components which every big all electronics companies would know how to use so they disassemble the product you give to them from this assembly they pull out what you can call as technical nutrients <laughs> they are nutrients but like small components parts which can be reused and then those are again used back into production cycle and this is this completes a technical cycle so this is the actual process which you know is described in cradle to cradle design is it does it make sense to you now is it clear now is it clearer now <laughs> i know you did understand things before also but i just wanted to know if this helps you understand what i was saying earlier a little better uh ma madam uh, just uh, yeah. on, you know vocabulary uh, how it is different from uh, saying recycling in biological and recycling in the technical is actually recycling only right because it is not always recycling it can be upcycling also so recycling is i, I mean it's a recycling is a very general word which is used for almost everything these days but uh, the technical term sometimes is upcycling for example like if you take a product and you use parts of it and you make another better product that is upcycling so a lot of this is recycling but it's also some of it is also upcycling some of it is also downcycling so you would reuse parts of that product uh, and you make some other product which may not be as good but it is still another product it's not like going completely waste so okay. uh, it's just semantics it's just a little bit of wording i mean otherwise the idea is recycling because recycling if you see you know that circle is complete is what we mean by recycling but just on the technical side this is they include both upcycling yes. downcycling both. uh yeah, yeah i got it so basically it is cycling cycling yes. in nature and cycling in the real physical world in the technical technical things technical cycle is what we call
so like biological items you can't keep reusing them infinitely right if it's an apple you can't keep eating it forever it will degrade but after it degrades also you can compost it and you can make it into fertilizer and that fertilizer can be used in the field that is the idea behind it that biodegradable materials degrade basically by definition right so you can't use them as is infinitely but the idea is to keep using items infinitely so biological cycle is for those items which can which degrade and in the degraded form can be used in some good way instead of just throwing it somewhere uh, you compost it for example or you make some other fibers out of it or you make something else out of it like coffee grounds are used to make some other products many times so that is a different process the technical cycle is for items which cannot be so easily degraded so like screws in the laptop for example and maybe some components of a laptop or a screw uh, i'm i'm mean, talking about screw because that was very easy to relate to but there are certain components like you know the hard drive the parts of the hard drive the arduino the other things which i'm not an electronics engineer but you know there are parts which can be reused again by some other company for some other purpose without it be getting degraded we can refurbish it we can improve it but it does it's not going to get degraded anytime so basically so uh, that is just the difference so if i go back to the question now i'll just give the answer now i think we've spent enough time on this i think it's visible now so the first is correct infinite circulation of nutrients and products second is not correct because cradle to cradle design does not mimic nature in that particular way it mimics nature in philosophical way that there is infinite circulation of materials and things like that but it's not making products which look more like nature that is biomorphism said so third is upcycling of materials into other products is correct uh, d is minimization of waste that is also correct because we are trying to you know minimize uh, the, the waste and stuff and e is also correct so only one is wrong all the others were correct so uh, the third is actually a very straight forward question so it's just a trick question but it's a straight forward question i will not spend too much time on that i just wanted to spend a little bit of time on systems thinking so does anybody want to take a shot at systems thinking what is systems thinking because this is slightly important so if you have doubts about it now would be the right time to ask me yeah uh, i can give my definition basically a system means there are elements and uh, subsystems as a part of it working together okay for example uh, in the, um, the humans machines environment agriculture okay uh, maybe it's a part of the system the outcome of the system is uh, is actually cannot be traced to one particular subsystem but it is a collective emergence of that okay so so in that context uh, this uh, the system output is something which is totally new and which we don't see in the behavior of individual elements as part of the system okay uh, so that is right. how we do systems thinking yeah okay so a system has so uh, just to give a little bit of that's that's correct everything you said is correct so systems thinking just for your understanding is a very old philosophy it's not something new it was developed in i think the 50s by professor j forrester i think that am it and it's a very broad way of looking at things and this philosophy since then has been used in almost every field in the world it has been used a lot in management a lot in electronics that these two i know and its origins are based in control theory so control theory itself is kind of an electronics related thing so uh, if any of you will have an electronics background you may have of course used it or heard of it but even if you have not 
no sweat nothing to worry about we will but we will dis, we will not discuss in a whole lot of detail but if you do want to read it in detail i will give you a reading link it's a good good reading resource but why this designer started to use systems thinking is the real question here which is because when we are designing something it fits into a system right a lot of times we don't realize but we're introducing little little products into existing systems and we are some way sometimes disrupting these systems or changing the way they function so unless we can really understand how our product is fitting into a system or not fitting into a system we can't really get a very full view of how successful it ha it has been it will be it will not be we are kind of a bit clueless we are stuck only at the user level we if you think only at the user level we are not thinking about the bigger picture in which the products are fitting now systems thinking um this is the slightly easier definition <coughs> from interaction um design foundation um you can you can read this on your own time but basically it says the same thing which i've already said but this is the more important part this is the definition given by another professor at mit which is professor james pale he's given this in his explanation the important parts of what i've highlighted that a system is a set of interdependent parts and they share a common purpose and the performance of the whole is affected by each and every one of its parts so this definition is i think the shortest but the most important most succinct definition there is of a system so just pay a little def important um say just pay a little importance to each word in this definition and then see what you think could be a system what you think you is not going to be a system so don't worry about the questions i will not have time to maybe discuss them all in the class i will share it with you and i will share the solutions as well and uh, we will discuss whatever questions you have about this in the next class it's not an assignment just for you to understand and uh, if you uh, have any other questions about the questions you can ask me or the assignment you already been given i can't discuss the solutions to the assignment that's why i called i got the practice questions because you know you have to do the assignment submission first before i can discuss the solution so now this is the important part actually what are the features of a system the features are that you know all parts must be firstly interrelated so it's not that you just put parts together and that makes a system no all those things need to talk to each other they interact with each other or they connect with each other in some way either functionally or literally physically or in some other way they're interacting with each other and in all those things little little things they come together to make one to serve one common purpose they're all united by one common purpose the sequence or the order in which you put those items together also matters and if one item is also missing the whole thing cannot really function as a system and the way it attempts to maintain its stability is through feedback its stability means maintain its sort of like status quo that is through feedback so this is like a diagrammatic representation of a fair system like you know one thing connects to the other it tends to the other then the third connects to the second fourth connects to the fifth first connects to the fourth so you see it's all interconnected through many many parts many many ways either physically or through information system or something else and um this is a little bit more complex but okay we, we will go through this that there are certain principles of a system there are events and then there are patterns and there are system structures which decide all of these this i will come to later maybe in the next class i won't go too much into the types of system because professor benerjee has already discussed this yeah this diagram is what i wanted to come to so this diagram is what i made just to explain what we mean by a system so there are some things which are not exactly i wasn't able to really convey it i will just try to mark it here so that these sub systems are also often interconnected so it's not just that 
they are connecting to elements and these elements may be connected may not be connected they may connect with each other or with something else but they all interact also it's not only that they follow this hierarchy within that hierarchy also they talk to each other right now this is just we'll conclude here i think today with this example of uh, thermos now i have taken this as a flask this is like sort of like my own water bottle here is just a figure of that so this example like for example let's just say this water bottle is a system right what do you think could be subsystems for this so say this cap can be a subsystem right this body is a second subsystem and these two subsystems also have other parts inside them which function together to serve a purpose right and the cap has this other tiny thing cover on top and the zipper over here and it has this handle here so the zipper this um this cap of the zipper the zipper this handle this ring these threads inside the rubber inside all of these come together to make one sub system which is this cap for the water bottle for the water bottle there is an inside wall which is say steel in this case there is an outside wall which is some other material some other metal maybe and paint inside it they put some other insulating material or they put sometimes copper or something so there are some other two or maybe one or two other items within the inside and outside wall they go inside and all of these together you can't remove even one part of it right otherwise the bottle will not function the way it should even in this if the handle is broken i can't carry the water bottle so it doesn't serve the purpose properly which it's supposed to serve if this cap is broken or if i can't close this cap again i can't use the water bottle because the water will be leaking or it will <coughs> make my bag a very you know uh, it will make the bag filthy things like that so it is all working together to form one subsystem and these two subsystems also need to come together unless i can close this water bottle it's not a water bottle it's just a tumbler right so for it to be a water bottle and serve the function of a water bottle these two need to come together also so these two sub systems come together to make this one water bottle which is an entire system now this water bottle tries to maintain its status quo through its own sub systems and elements in the sub system so all of these little little parts which form the sub system are elements and um there can be further hierarchy also in much more complex things sub systems contain sub sub systems and sub sub systems finally broken down into elements it can be multiple levels of hierarchy this is the simplest level that i could think of so uh i just wanted to give this example so the whole idea of a system is clear to you because we'll be using it a lot in further lectures also so um you can ask me any questions if you have about this now otherwise uh, what i'll do is i will share these um, practice questions with all of you it's not an assignment you can just read through it and see what you think is the correct answer and i'll give a solution so just compare your answer with the solution and see if it's making sense to you because there are some questions on systems thinking also in that which i didn't get to but after this discussion hopefully it will be clearer so uh those questions which i have you know not discussed in class today just let me know if you have questions and we will discuss it in the next class right so anything else that i missed you want to discuss or can we end the session here i think uh, there are four people still here if you don't have any further questions then uh, these links will be shared with you and the question example question which i have made there are eight questions in this you can just go over it and try it out it's not an assignment you can just try it out for your own understanding purposes okay so if everything is good i will this video will also be uploaded to youtube so yeah sidhu please go ahead um you can just unmute yourself and speak if you're saying something hello yes 
Uh, I just wanted to ask the assignment that we've been assigned. I mean, that we have to solve. We'll discuss the answers once the date is over. Yes. So once that submission date is finished, I will discuss the answers for that. Okay. Done. Anything else? So in the further classes, we can discuss any doubts, questions you have. But otherwise, um, you know that is like, of course, the central idea that questions you have should get clarified. But otherwise, I will also bring some practice questions of mine or some slides in which I want to ask or discuss some concepts which I think may have been not so, uh, you know, which are slightly complex, which I think students may want to discuss further in a live session. So that's how I think we can use our time the best. And I'll be happy if more and more of you join and bring your questions. So if you don't ask questions, I will ask questions. That's just how it's going to work. So it's nicer maybe if you ask me questions so I can answer Madam, them first before I start asking questions. Madam, yes. Uh, one, yes. one just a philosophical question. Okay. Yes. See, we have been talking about discouraging use of fossil fuels, right? But uh, if you look at uh, the way the fossils have been formed for millions and billions of years ago, the fossils also are transformation of a biological materials, plants, animals, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is also a part of a nature cycle. So they have been transformed into fossils for millions of years. And now we are taking out those fossils and using them. And again, uh, we are dying, plants, animals are dying and going back to the air. So in a way, if you, if you look at that at a macro big cycle, that is also natural recycling. So that is not, uh, you know, so what you're missing here is a time scale. What we have achieved, the level of unsustainability or consumption we have achieved has happened mostly over a period of 100 and 150 years. Whereas the earth has evolved over a period of billions of years to be what it is today. So even whether it is biodiversity or whether you talk about fuels or whether you talk about nature, the mountains didn't get formed in a day, right? Mountains also formed through the most movement of the tectonic plates over millions of years. The continents didn't get formed the way they are today in just a decade, right? It happened over several ice ages. So we have gone through several ice ages for the earth to look what it is today. And whereas what we have achieved, the kind of, you know, um, you can say the kind of use, consumption, and the kind of exhaustion of all resources of nature we have achieved in the last, has been just in the last 150 years. Maybe you can say 200, but mostly 150. The, the main time period of concern is 150. And even in that 150, the last 60 years have been, there's been an exponential increase post-World War era, right? So you cannot compare it with nature cycle is what I'm trying to say. What part is anthropogenic? What is the contribution of human beings has to be seen as contribution of human beings. Otherwise you can't solve the problem. If you see, see human beings are also part of nature. So that way you can say everything is nature only, right? We are also nature, that's also nature and nature doing its to its own self, it doesn't work like that, no. Because if you classify yourself as nature, then there is no logic, there is no differentiation only then. When human okay. beings are also part of nature, then what we are doing okay. is also nature's ways only. Okay, okay. So, I, 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 right. Yeah, I, I, so I'm just saying that if you, the question is to solve a problem, because it's not just that plastic doesn't decompose, which is a problem. Plastic in ocean actually affects marine life. Plastic on land actually affects land temperatures. Plastics everywhere else actually contribute to microplastics in our food, in our water. And those microplastics affect our health, cause hormonal imbalances in human beings. So it has ripple effects. It's not just one, like, you know, kg of plastic lying in some corner. It has multiple, multiple, multiple layers of effects, which we have to deal with, which we have to deal with. It's not just that nature is dealing with it. Okay, nature is there. All right, our plant will look less pretty for the future generations. But our future generations also deserve better health, right? Better ways to heal their health. They will not have that. So when we talk about sustainability on a longer timeline, it's not just about dumping some material in a landfill alone. It's what happens when we dump materials in a landfill. What happens, you know, do you know that there is an island in the ocean, which is the size of, I think, France or something, which is only plastic. 
there's a complete island a huge mass of island which is only plastic floating in the ocean go and search on it search for it on google you will find it if you don't find it i'll share it in the next class it's an entire island of just plastic because humans have dumped so much plastic in the ocean that it has come together and formed an island all these floating plastics in in the ocean they actually hurt marine life very badly in marine life loss of marine life is not just a problem for that marine life it's a problem for us also so it has ripple effects and it has effects on us also not just the planet which is why we need to think about sustainability we're not doing a favor to somebody else by doing that we are doing our own selves a favor also and our future generation so our future generation means our own future generation you know not somebody else's so i mean this is a more philosophical discussion i think this is just this is what i believe to be the reasons for pursuing sustainability as a goal i would to design or something else uh, but yeah let's let's leave it here i think because we are kind of out of time it's uh, everybody has been very kind to stay till the end i really appreciate that so let's hope everybody will join in future sessions also that is on saturdays 3 to 5 pm okay so i'll end it here thank you everyone for joining and i'll see you in the next session